Things are finally getting winter. Isn't that great? <laughs> are there any announcements from the pews? Just a reminder that our Lenten dinners and programs begin this Wednesday, and the first one will be the Truck Stop Outreach Ministry that is um, focused on the Columbia Truck Stop. And um, in the back, if you plan on going, please sign up. If you happen to know what you're thinking of bringing, please add that as well. This way I have a general idea of who to expect, if to expect anyone. But I also realized that, I don't know about you, but I'm a little confused this week about when we're supposed to be getting snow and possibly getting snow and getting rain, and et cetera, et cetera. So if you see snow on Wednesday, get on Facebook. I will post it on Facebook whether it's been you know, still going or canceled because uh, we don't want people coming out if it's going to be treacherous or you know, we'll, we'll, ah, use my words, <laughs> a lot of snow. <laughs> So keep that in mind too as well. Thank you. And anything else? Song? Oh, Bonnie, I'm sorry. Just a reminder that the, the flower chart is up in the back. Hmm. And next week I'll have a paper for you to sign up if you change your um, phone number, address, uh, email address, or whatever, and if you want it listed, we got to update some directory stuff and would be appreciated. Okay. okay. Let us begin our Lenten journey with number 2112, Jesus Walk this little son down. <laughs>
Now is the time in our worship where we raise before God and one another our joys, our cares, our concerns. So I would ask are there any prayer requests this morning? Yes, Lo? I got two joys. Um, one is it's just amazing how God is taking care of this food pantry. I mean, people are just helping in many, many different ways. So it's just a great, great joy. Um, and of course, the other one is I am so thankful that we're finally getting some snow. <laughs> Gracious, loving, giving God, once again, Lord, we have gathered together as a family of faith, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as those whose hearts and lives and spirits have been touched by you, blessed by you, challenged by you, but are here this day just to praise you and say thank you and to offer ourselves to you. Lord, you are God of all creation, Lord of our lives. You put the planets in their place, and yet you know us each by name and the number of hairs on our heads. And for all your blessings, Lord, we are here to say thank you and to offer ourselves to you. And in this time of praise and worship, we also come with cares and concerns in our hearts that we place on your altar, knowing that you hear, that you care, that you answer in your way and in your time. And we continue our prayers for Jim this morning, Lord, who is, we thank you for the progress he has made to have gone from crutches to cane. It's a great progress, um, but it is frustrating, as you probably well know. But continue to help him heal so well and to give him the patience, Lord, he needs to let his body heal so that he can return to work and return in full health and full strength. So be with him and keep him in your care. We pray the same for Liz, who's recovering from knee surgery. It's never easy in recovery, but we thank you for progress that she has made and just help her to return to fullness and wholeness of health. And God, you have blessed this church for decades now with the ministry and mission of the food pantry. And we are so blessed and grateful to be your hands in this mission and in this ministry and grateful to be here for those who are in need. Continue to bring people to us, Lord. And Actually, I pray that we may never need a food pantry again. This would mean that everyone is well supplied and is working and has all the financial needs met. But until that time, Lord, use us as you will and continue to bless those who come. And Lord, there are a couple among us, not just Larry, but there are some among us who are grateful for the snow that is in the forecast uh, coming our way. We thank you for the blessing of winter and the blessing of seasons and all that diversity it brings. And it's just a reminder of you, of the cycle of life, and your genius, and all your blessings on us. So thank you for the snow that has come. And Lord, we celebrate this day with Ruth, her birthday, and just thank you for her blessing among us and all that she is in, to, in our community and in our church. And we just ask your blessings on her for years to come. Uh, continue. 
need to use her and offer gifts of food prep. And Lord, for the ship's family who are mourning, grieving the passing of Mary, uh, for all who were touched by her life and her closest family, we pray that your spirit would bring them comfort and peace in the weeks and months ahead. It was never easy, but we know through you that that peace that passes all understanding will eventually one day fill their hearts. And Lord, we continue our prayers for the uh, countries of Turkey and Syria who were hit by another major earthquake. So much devastation is hitting that country, those, that part of the world, Lord, that we place in your care all those who have lost loved ones, who have lost their homes, who, whose future is just so uncertain at this time. We pray that somehow your hands can reach out to them, continue to sustain them, and may they feel your presence and know that you are walking with them through all of this get them through. And may they finally uh, find peace of heart and trust in you through, in the midst of all of this devastation. And Lord, there are those who are worshiping with us from their kitchens and from their couches that uh, have cares and concerns as well that they place on your altar at this time. Lord, for those who have been named, who need your healing touch, we ask you as our great physician to place your healing hand on them and return them to fullness and fullness of health. For those who have been named who may be grieving at this time, we ask that your spirit brings them comfort and peace. And for those who have just celebrated their blessed event, we thank you for being there, sharing in that event, making it all the more joyful. And as always, Lord, we pray for this world, where there is war, let there be peace, where there's oppression, let there be freedom. For this hunger, may they be fed. For this illness, may they be healed. Through us, through others, may this world come to know the peace this kingdom you have promised. Through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, your will, will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, bread and forgive, forgive us our trespasses, as we, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Micah 6, chapter 6. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, as also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted, and what Balaam, son of Baor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down and exalt before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offering, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And as we would stand and sing number 2174, what does the Lord require of you? And once you get to that page, um, we're just going to go through them, each one as a verse, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, we'll sing it through twice.
be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is a new reality TV show, at least new for me, on. I just picked it, started watching it the past couple of weeks. Um, it's called Special Forces, World's Toughest Test. And the whole premise of this show is that celebrities volunteer, as far as I know, um, to be on this show, and they are put through some of the tests one would go through if you were actually joining our military's special forces. So you can imagine, they are tough, tough tests. And the contestants that are on there, you know, some ones I have seen, you know, one's a a uh, retired football pl pro football player, one's a retired basketball player, one's an Olympic uh, sw uh, swimmer. One actually is one of the previous bachelorette stuff. And another one was, uh, he wasn't a congressman or a senator, but he had something to do with our politics in Washington. And it was you know, high up there, most people would have known his name. And so these are the kind of people who are allowing themselves to be put through this Rigor, rigorous testing. Uh, as far as I've heard so far, there is no thing about, ah, the last one standing wins thousands of dollars. There's none of that. And even when they can't complete, uh, complete a task, they're not kicked off. They're reamed out and you failed and they, and they you know, get into them, but they're not kicked off. The only way to get kicked off is to voluntarily do it yourself. Most people have just said, I can't do this anymore, and they turn in their number badge and they walk off. Only one of so far that I've seen has been taken off the show because he had an allergic reaction. He went into anaphylactic shock from something, some bug bite, and um, so they had to remove him, so he was officially off. So, as I look at these people willing to test their own metal against, just against themselves for no particular reason, I was thinking about today's passage of what Jesus was put through and tempted on. Now, it's a little different. The, whole, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. It wasn't uh, like he decided to do this on his own. But in the same way, when you think about why in the world would Jesus have had to have been tempted or tested, you know, why put him through that? Why did the Spirit think that Jesus needed to go through these three temptations. He knew who he was. He's known since at least 12 years old who he was, God's son. He had just heard it. What you didn't hear this morning was a passage right before this, and it's his baptism. And of course, after he's baptized by John, um, the voice from heaven comes and said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So he had no doubt who he was. But I'm beginning to think that maybe the spirit felt he needed to test or flex his muscles a little bit and, and to just be crystal clear on his calling and on what was to come after this. Because from here on, he goes and starts his mission and his ministry in the world for three years. So if Jesus was needed to be tested or tempted, who are we to think that we don't need it? Hence the purpose and the time of Lent. 
It's not biblical, it is not in the Bible, but this is a good representation, a good way to think about it. That, you know, just like every parent gets their child to eat their broccoli, eat their vegetables, because it's good for them, even if they don't like it. Maybe we should think of Lent in the same way. So let's look at these temptations. The first one, it's easy. You know, it tells us, scripture tells us that he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Then the devil came to him. And scripture tells us he was hungry. In some contemporary translations, it says he was starving, which I think is probably far more accurate. And so, what has Satan said? Well, since you're the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. The first thing, this first temptation should um, show us that most of us, it's often overlooked, is that all temptations are good. They look good, sounds good, makes sense. I mean, Jesus was starving. Why shouldn't he, since he's able to, turn those stones into bread? But he answers that we live not just on bread alone, but by the word of God. But in that, looking at things and thinking about temptations are always for the good. If the devil had said, hey, turn these stones into cow pies, it would have been real easy to you know, not go through with it or be tempted by it. So what does that tell us about the temptations we face in life? Most of them seem good. Maybe not as clear-cut good and evil, but they're good to some degree, some level. How do you think addictions begin? Nobody wakes up thinking, okay, I think I'll overeat today so I can get obese. Or, um, oh, maybe I'll start drinking heavy today because I want to be an alcoholic or a drug addict or, you know, fill in the blank. They're subtle things. And it's when you start hearing those little voices in your head saying, I deserve this, or I need this, or, you know, I, I, what are some of the things? I have rights. This is mine. Think about how people responded during the pandemic to things like toilet paper. How they fought over it because they thought they deserved it. Or ask Larry, because he was working at Target at this point, what they asked when, what he was yelled at, what was yelled at him over cans of Lysol. My family's going to die because you won't let me buy two cans of Lysol. You know, people felt they had the right, and it was theirs, and it's temptations, yes, having toilet papers handy, yes, having Lysol in, a, in your house during the pandemic, both of those are good, but don't overdo it, leave some for everybody else, you know, temptations are sneaky, sneaky, and good, and what made it even more so, or did more difficult for Jesus is that the devil um, quoted God, he goes, since you're the son of God, turn these, you know, turn these loaves into, turn these stones into bread. You know, this is what was just said at his baptism. This is my son, God's voice. This is my son, who I, with whom I am well pleased. So, you know, when you stick a little extra in there that you're quoting scripture, you're quoting what God said, it's got to be good. But how many... How much divisiveness has ended up in our society? Because people are quoting the Bible, claiming their way is right. How, how about our own denomination at this point? There's so much divisiveness within it on the global level because people are quoting scripture. How many religious wars have been fought? You know, just because you throw in what God said, or what you think God said, doesn't make it right and doesn't always make it good. So we have to sit there and think about and, and consider what's going on. The second temptation comes in, and now the devil throws in a dare. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself off the highest point in the temple. And you're, the angel, again, he quotes scripture and says the angel says the angels will basically catch you and not let your feet hit the rock. Here again is that double dare, using scripture 
to make it sound right, make it sound good. But of course, Jesus says, you know, don't tempt the Lord your God. What he's saying is, think about all of scripture. Don't just nitpick or don't just take out one little verse out of context and think that it's what you wanted to say. The lesson here is to look at all scripture in its own context and then in context biblically. In the whole, the examples I could think of, for those of you who are parents, most of us are parents, have been parents here. Did you know that if you couldn't get your kid under control, you could have asked the elders of your town to stone them to death? That's in the Old Testament. It was a, a lot. I don't know how often it was taken, yeah, anyone took them up on it, but it's a law in the Old Testament that allows parents to do that. How does that fit in with, thou shalt not murder? Or Jesus' command of, love one another. You can't take it just out of context and think that it's okay. You have to look at the broader picture. Or the other one, there's in the book of Acts. We hear the early church, the early believers, everyone was sharing everything with everybody. They all shared and shared alike. Well, so if I come up to you and say, well, if you call yourself a Christian, give me your car. Is that right? Of course not. When we think about sharing everything, I mean, or do, in this way, you know, oh, you can demand things of others. What happened to thou shalt not covet? Or thou shalt not steal? Or Jesus' recommendation of store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not here on earth. So no matter how good a, a scripture might sound pulled out and all by itself, you have to think about it in the larger context. And I remember when I started really studying scripture, studying what it meant to be a Christian, and, and Pastor Steve was here, I remember, remember him telling me, if some part of scripture contradicts what Jesus has taught, always follow Jesus. We're Christians. That's my plumb line. That has been my plumb line throughout my faith. If it contradicts what Jesus said, follow what Jesus says. It's as easy as that. So, with this last temptation, what the devil was doing was basically just switching around the first temptation he ever gave in Scripture to Adam and Eve. You know, if you will bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these things you will be. What did he offer to Adam and Eve? You know, if you bite the apple, you'll become like God. What they didn't realize, remember, was that they were already made in the image of God, and they really didn't need that because they already were. And that's why Jesus, when he is tempted with almost the same temptation, he can answer, no, serve the Lord your God and serve him alone and worship him only. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus was crystal clear on what he was to do and who he was to worship and whose son he was. So that was an easy temptation. During Lent, we should use this time to consider who we are and whose we are, to be clearer, become clearer on our faith. And in whatever way you need to do this, whether it's more prayer time, more uh, devotional time, more meditation time, or whatever gets you closer to God and gets you thinking about what is truly God's will and what is truly God's way in the world. And to recognize those good temptations that are out there that might make us think, oh, this has to be according to God, but it's not. Because Jesus went through this, I believe, to learn to flex his spiritual muscles, to become crystal clear on what he wants to do. And what I'm thinking, what came to me on my drive here, believe it or not, um, so, I assume most of you know, for the past two years, I have been regularly going to the gym two days a week, at least. Trying to sneak a third in, but that usually doesn't happen. And usually at 6.30 in the morning, Elisa and I have the gym almost to ourselves. But in these past few weeks, how dare people? There's so many more people in there. You have to actually fight if you want to, you know, have to get there quick and claim a piece of equipment if you want to work on it. And even yesterday, we went Saturday afternoon, and again, 
It wasn't crowded, but there were still a good amount of people there, which, does, which doesn't happen. And I commented about this to Elisa. She goes, Mom, spring is coming. Bikini season is coming. People are here <laughs> trying to get, get a little bit better shape. Well, Lent is the same way. We're to get our spiritual muscles in shape, to become clear about how we understand Jesus, how we follow him. This is what Jesus had to go through. The Spirit felt Jesus needed this. I'm sure we need to. Jesus was starting his mission. He was going to gather up a group of 12 men who would eventually become followers, who would be eventually become his disciples. And disciple just means a follower who eventually becomes a teacher. Jesus didn't come to create Christianity. Jesus came initially to just get the Jewish faith and Jewish followers back on track. And that would take disciples. And in fact, just a bit of trivia here, the word disciple is mentioned over 250 times in the New Testament. The word Christian, only three. He wants us to be disciples. So this in Lent, it's a time to think about yourself and how are you a are you a disciple? If I were to ask here and, and ask which are you, if I asked who here considers themselves a Christian, I assume all of you would raise your hand. But if I were to ask how many here are a disciple of Christ, I'm not quite sure what the answer would be. That's for each of you to consider for yourselves. Are you a Christian? And how have you made that step to becoming a disciple of sharing the faith, teaching the faith, growing the faith in others? This Lent, work on your flex of spiritual muscles, grow closer to God, grow clearer about your faith. And in this way, when it comes to Easter, this April, you will, I believe, realize more fully how you are still a part of that story and carrying on the mission of Christ in this world. May you be blessed. Amen. Amen. Please join me in responding there. Almighty God, God be with us, us as we contend with our lives and all our challenges. Thank you for listening as we bring before you the troubles that way us down. We affirm it is written, one does not live by bread alone. 
strengthen and sustain our families and our communities, nurture the bonds between us, and inspire us to live with empathy and forgiveness. Jesus, our Redeemer, rescue us, Holy Son. We proclaim it is written, Worship the Lord your God, serve Him only. Enable us to admit the temptations of the world and to support us to resist turning away from your teaching. Awaken us to recognize the gifts you have given each one of us and to see the role you can play in healing your creation. God, our Creator, inspire us with renewed hope. We acknowledge it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Deepen our faith to hear your word and follow your way. And encourage us to bring all our hopes and desires to you in prayer, that in lifting up our souls to you, we may be shaped by your love. Holy Spirit, our Comforter, sustain us in our times of trial. All this we pray, assured by your eternal love. Amen. Linda, can I ask you to bring up the offering? Please join me in dedicating our offering. God of the wilderness, we give these offerings in gratitude, rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give these offerings in faith, trusting that you will provide for our needs. We give these offerings in hope, knowing that you can use them to spread your love in this world. And with these offerings, we give ourselves. May we live with generous hearts and an open hands. Amen. Our closing hymn is actually number 2214 in the faith we sing, but in your pew edition, you only have the refrain. You don't have the verses. So that's why they're all typed out for us. And um, I'm assuming you guys know this one. We've done this enough. Uh, so we will begin with the refrain and then go through it and then just follow it through the verses as written. So let us stand it. <laughs>
grows big spiritual muscles that you may be going out into this world and blessing it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.